white ethnicity by reducing the racial health disparities and raising quality of life. Let's welcome Edward Jones. Assistant Health Commissioner and Acting Chief Health Equity Officer at Columbus Public Health, um, where we are protecting health and improving lives of the nearly 1 million residents of Columbus and Worthington and the 48 million visitors to our city every year. Um, on behalf of our Health Commissioner, Dr. Roberts, um, the Center for Public Health Innovation, which can you guys raise your hands? They're all behind you working. Assets we have here in the city of Columbus, the Franklin Park Conservatory, an 88 acre retreat right here in the center of our city. Um, we're here to celebrate the joy of Juneteenth, a holiday that, through acknowledging that so many find joy in growing and consuming fresh foods, and we honor those who take part in agriculture through the act of growing produce and teaching others how to do the same. I'm very proud that on this. continuing fight against racism in all of its forms and the fight for health equity that we have before us as a city and as a community. Uh, for us, food security and access are two of the 20 plus social determinants of health that inform our work and that's from working with community partners on the local food action plan, addressing gaps in our local food system, ensuring access to fresh and local and healthy foods. I could go on and on and on keynote speaker, his co-presenter, and our panel. So uh, let me get to the point. Um, first, I'm going to introduce one of our presenters, Ms. Jennifer Bailey, who has a lifelong passion that has led her down the path of sharing stories of liberation of the Underground Railroad and her connection with the land. Her roots lie, lie in farming in both Southwest Ohio and Southwest Georgia. Uh, she grew up on her family's multi-generational farm, where she worked as part of her family-owned and operated Christmas tree. She's also worked as an environmental educator in the Dominican Republic, where she partnered with youth and women's groups on sustainable community projects with families. And the gentleman that I think we are all here to hear from um, this afternoon, our headliner, Mr. Jim Embry. Mr. Embry describes himself as a sacred earth activist and as such has participated in most of the major social justice movements of his era. He now believes that the sustainability movement encompasses all of the other movements. He's the founder and director of Sustainable Communities Network, and Mr. Henry continues, contributes, excuse me, to the theory and practice of sustainable living while cultivating collaborative efforts at the local, national, and international levels with a focus on food systems. So with that, can we please welcome Mr. Henry? Think about 
Christopher Columbus. You see his name. And the trauma that he brought to this land that we haven't quite healed in the health Innovation Center, I was reading about the 1519 project. It's that point in time of African slavery that's being brought to America. But before 1619, which for Columbus, because we all know the second most used city name in the country is Columbus. The name of our capital. District of As we know, Columbus was an evil, cruel person who came into the into the uh, West, uh, into the Caribbean and pretty much wiped out all of the indigenous people who were there. Tainos Airwalk. He was so evil that even the, those who sent him over there, he wasn't lost and he wasn't trying to find. They came over here and they arrested him. He was excommunicated and banned the church for 200 years. And then we rediscovered him. So I'm going to suggest, thinking about this question of justice towards the future, let's think about this community and how do we heal from that Columbus legacy. So Jeff and I are honored. To be with you all, this beloved Columbus community. But a special shout out to our dear beloved dear friend, Lakita Porter, who invited us here. And this is an old country boy from Kentucky. And, and Jennifer's an old is a young country girl from Ohio. Okay. She was a country boy. She trusted me enough, enough to um, invite us here to be with you all. Thank you, dear heart, and, uh, for being here. And uh, we're going to have a marvelous time. We're going to share some things that we haven't heard before about Juneteenth, this question of the foundation of racism in the country and the pathway forward. We have a PowerPoint we'll be using. Everything works properly. And again, if you want to. Um, Way forward, justice, solving health disparities, solving problems in our communities, in our young people that get locked up, that go unlocked up in the homeless conditions and so forth, requires joy. The type of people who manifest joy throughout this journey in America. So, Jennifer, give us uh, a little background for our partners here. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, good. I met Jennifer Bree about a year ago in the State of the Black World Conference in Baltimore, Maryland. And at that time, I, I didn't know, but meeting a farmer from Kentucky when I grew up on a farm in Ohio, quite a while ago, it made such a difference to me. The history that he shared about his family coming together after the Civil War in the Black Chautauqua and Cleveland Alliance Fair coming together in community was so powerful that it made me think, you know, what can I do? How can I lift up my voice here in Ohio? And I've had a number of these. talking about the movement of sustainability, stolen land, stolen labor, and agriculture. And the first presentation that we did together was the Black Women Growers Conference. It was a full group of conference of mostly black folks coming together about agriculture nationally in Philadelphia to talk about fair markets, the flow of resources. And from there, we continued Teaching. 
and we uh, attended the George Washington Carver Learning Class, learned about Carver and the impact that he's making today, and then we also continued to the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Conference and talked about seeds and the importance of the Cumberland Seed Challenge in Kentucky that they're growing. So this is the nature of the work that we've been up to about women and seeds and it's the, these six pathways. Uh, and that's where we are today. So we form what we call the Systems Transformation Partnership. We work primarily with higher education, but also community groups, government groups as well, advising on these pathways to a sustainable future. We work again because of Mark's connection there with Ohio State. We worked and did on calls with the likes of um, Selman College, Tuskegee, Gilbert. Um, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, uh, Cornell, and for Cornell, we're studying what are called the legacy of humans talking to plants. We're in Ohio State, as Mr. mentioned. Up there, we are working with them on their reading from a cosmic legacy of growing sweet potatoes, but eating the, eating the leaves as food as they think about going to Mars. the walls of space models are going to Mars. Okay. Uh, it's something people here should know. They're using Carver's legacy in his name. And OSU should make sure they're being transparent and involved with you all as a community in those kind of conversations. So this is what we're doing. Uh, I live in Kentucky and Ohio College is very good to me. My great granddad went to school there in 1879. And he went there with the likes of uh, a guy named Carter G. Woodson. You all might know of him as the um, father of what we now call Black History Month. Lester Lowell was very proud of the Kentucky. So we're on the beginning again. And um, so we have uh, developed what we call uh, the six pathways to a sustainable future. The first pathway is. Second pathway is indigenous wisdom. Third pathway being George Washington Carver and the African American ethos. Fourth pathway being art, music, and hip hop. This one, seeds and total modulation, this is international, social, daily, not been a few years. The last pathway is vision that is transformative. Those are our six pathways. Based upon my work in sustainability since probably since 1979 or so. But I helped form a book co-op in 1972. We recognize then that you keep the way we're eating. We see here today talking about health disparities. We did back then. So these are our identified pathways. We should encourage you all to look at these. Use them, throw them out. Back in 2020, during COVID, my group, I co-founded a group called Daughters of the Underground, and we began walking in the land. And so we, uh, walking the Underground Railroad was a way of reconnecting for me. Um, being out there walking, we walked up to 20 miles for a group of eight women, black women, with historical roots in the eastern shore of Maryland, creating this idea that we could trace Harriet Tubman's path as a way of claiming our own liberation today. Yeah. Thank you. As a way of claiming our own our own uh, liberation today. And during that time coming together collectively to create this walk, that's what we found. And through that experience
some of the um, educational, environmental work that I've done in the Dominican Republic and some of the traveling that I've done. At the end, we, this idea of the stolen land, the stolen labor, this really hit home to me, that this is why black folks are here, because of, of the agricultural work that, is, that, was, um, that was required, that, that, that was, you know, that being stolen from the, the shores of Africa, that is what has taken this black diaspora. And so when I began to really see that and to walk the journey of Harriet Tubman, then this work I really wanted to be able to speak about. And so we've got on the left here an indigenous person representing the Great Quebec, because when the Europeans arrived to these shores, taking over the land and removing the people that were here, taking it, creating the fences, saying this is mine, that's what occurred. And also, this is the nation's founding confidence, that's what we said. Because we're here for justice, we're here for democracy, we're here for everyone, and yet, we, without acknowledging this fundamental contradiction, we cannot move forward. It's important to understand that we're here today to talk about these health disparities and lack of justice in a wide variety of ways is part of the country's foundation. It's based upon land agriculture. That's why some of the people who are the most oppressed least paid, most underserved. service industry, mm -hmm. farm workers, so forth. But also this contradiction, we say now, is the major focal point of transformation. And we're all involved in the food movement, because we all eat. Sometimes we'll say it. All involved in the food movement. And we can all play a part beyond what we're doing now. What about your grow something? What about your compost? In the food movement, from A to Z, the whole system, in, my, in our view, is a spiritual pyramid. People other than us have defined. Part of the vision of the pathway, earth centric, woman centric, is return a sense of spirituality throughout our history. So, we're here today to talk about also Juneteenth justice and what that looks like. So, we were asked to come up with the outcome of Texas for today. You can listen here. And we hope that by the end of the day, we will. Outcomes. How do we deal with the role of agriculture in pushing food justice? What's the role of farmers? Things of that nature. But here's our uh, what we're trying to do in terms of outcomes. And I thought about uh, Juneteenth justice. What's out there now? It's a federal holiday, state holiday, uh, all across the nation. People celebrating. Uh, you know, all kinds of things around Juneteenth. But a lot of what's out there is Black folks in Texas didn't wait two years to know they were free. That's part of the narrative. Because first of all, when Lincoln signed the proclamation saying, okay, you folks are free, it meant nothing in the South. The South is an independent country, has its own president, constitution, money. Lincoln couldn't proclaim anything in the South. So folks didn't have to wait two years. They already knew things were already happening. But what happened when, uh, when the war broke out, folks like Martin Delaney, Harris 
coming for the drug issue, but I think it's black, black folk fight. And there's a white man in the war. And we'll talk it, we'll figure it out. And two years later, the South is winning the war. And kicking the North butt. Making the change of heart. And then opening up the doors and allowing black men and women to fight the nation. And some 200,000. Mustered in and began to fight in the Civil War. This is one of the um, signs that these folks around your community encourage you folks to muster in. And here's how the troops look. Whether or not your family were part of the U.S. Army. I'm on the table here. I have three military records of three of our folks who fought the Civil War. Three great grandfathers fought the Civil War. Two of them were brothers, one of them died. We all see this and that was part of who we see. Here's an actual image of some folks in Kentucky where my folks were supposed to end for Captain Nelson. So somewhere in here, somewhere in here, in this picture, my great great grandmother, her husband, her brother in law, and her other cousin, somewhere in there. Okay. One day I might be able to track it down. That's an actual image of the Captain Nelson. Now, this is where I live in Madison County. The little, little white house is where I live at. Um, the white house is where I live in. And this home here, uh, this, this land goes back to the 1800s. Listen, my folks were brought out of Nigeria largely around 1790. Here are folks from Mount Alaska, Kentucky. This land here, about 30 acres, was a whole community of black folks. Uh, we came down back in the 1800s. Don't just begin, don't just claim it. Our folks came there, and the grandmothers were in the fields, having babies in the fields, dropping their kids and mothers on their backs to keep working the farm. Came there, learned the land, learned the love of corn and farming, identified with the plant. That's where we're at now, where we were brought in 1800. So I'm honored to be there. Wait, with you all. This is a picture. Their father was born to die in the Civil War. Her mom was left in the war in 1865 with six kids, a single parent. Six kids, 16 to 2. But this woman who, by all measures, was the largest woman who signed this act, illiterate, dumb, didn't know anything, had her kids, they, they survived and thrived. They all owned property eventually. Her son, her younger son, and then went to college in 1879. He was there with a guy named James Bond, not 007. <laughs> okay. James Bond, the grandfather of Hugh and Bob. One of our team Bonds was an actor and so forth. So here's my folks here. Uh, and I will talk about this is Harriet, Elizabeth, and Mary, John Carl. And where I live now, again, is where my great grandfather, John Carl, was a bulk of in 1889. And this is an image of how their parents would look. Okay. During the war, this is how Papa looked, Mama looked, and there were two kids or six kids in the family. The point is, who died in the war? Died in the war. White had the courage and the, the, the boys with the joy. The joy. So, uh, and we know about the uh, history of Abigail Wells, Martin Delaney, and Terry Tubman, and those abolitionists, the men who encouraged Lincoln to let the black folks fight. And so, through my
my great granddad was part of the 114th Regiment, U.S. Coast Troops, out of Camp Nelson, and they were there when Lincoln and President Lee and Grant surrendered. Oh, here's military records. Don't believe me? Come up and check. They're right there. They're the ones that, that put Lee in a fist and move and, and, and caused him to surrender. They were there that night. That was in April 1865. A few weeks later, the end of April, the first part of May, 16,000 black people were shipped to Galveston by boat to quell the remaining Confederate forces as being impacted. Give him credit, he's a general. But give us some credit for that. Also, we think about Juneteenth, it's about Kimberly Day, Emancipation Day. It's also reunification day. We reunify the country. But don't believe me. Let's see what uh Lincoln says. He says the colored population is the inevitable yet unavailable of force for restoring the union. If we had in the North lost the war, the world would be entirely different. There would be no UN. There would be no USA, United States. The world would be entirely different. So if we had to come along, 200,000 strong black men and women to defeat the South. And do what? Reunify. Do what? Reunify. Reunify the nation. Reunification. The first war against those who in Britain wasn't about democracy. Again, yeah. it wasn't about democracy. It was about the continuation of African enslavement, the continuation of heaven land. George Washington said, well, you know, you know, you can actually save now. You're going to get a chance to take more land. Let's fight a war. The Civil War was the first war about democracy. Out of the Civil War, black people came to the South, came to the government, and gave what we now call preparation. I don't go into all of that. We're telling the truest story about emancipation, jubilee, and about reunification. But folks back then do. But it's actually, it's a well, if you talk about black men and women winning the war and defeating those Confederates who were taking the land from Mexico, then you can't do black folks. You can't do Jim Crow. They lost that part. Some are suggesting lift up Juneteenth in ways that can describe the true essence. So, the six pathways the first pathway we have is first century of the Civil War. And what we say is that the oppression of women is directly related to what's happening on Mother Earth. Directly related. And so, we... next slide. Yes. And yeah, so we're talking about the rights of Mother Nature and Mother Earth. Mother Earth, you know, humans, we have rights, right? We have the right to have free speech. We have, we have so many rights that we have given under the law. Does the water have rights? Does the earth have rights? You know, in the world we live in today, people have given so many things to the planet and Mother Earth. And from this view, we see that everything has been given to us by a mother. We all came through a woman to make this world better. All of us. And that female part of the plant that has seeds. And we see that Mother Earth is a big seed. So we call it the big seeding and not the big bang. <laughs> what would that be like? And we see that in great 
countries such as Ecuador and Bolivia, they have been creating and giving their poor under legal frameworks to the rights of Mother Earth. And that's something that we can consider to do today to protect the planet, protect our home, protect not just the human species, but all of the species. Everyone here, whether you were in the city of Columbus, Ohio State, organization, faith institution, your own community organization, ought to find a way to involve, include rights of nature, rights of Mother Earth within your bylaws, within your university you know, regulations, and whatever else. What about the future sustainably and have an earth that our great great grandkids can inherit? Eurocentric, industrialized, dominant, male dominant worldview to one that is earth centric and woman centric. All right. So, on the slide, we've got your sustainable food system, and we're talking about. Systems and what we can consider. I'm going to be doing some, some, some visioning later on this afternoon, and we'll incorporate some of those ideas. Asking you all, what is your vision of a future where there are no health disparities? We have food justice. We have good food for all. We're paying farmers well. We're, we're paying people, working women who work in the fast food industry. Living wage, health care, things like that. Well, I'm, we think I hear, I hear it. Okay. I'm sorry. So what's the very very best and first local food? Who knows? Who knows? The first and very best local food. Your garden. I know my friend Jen Bell. Why we centralize again at the first half way. Earth centric, woman centric. We all want to go to food conferences all the time. And never talk about breast feeding, breast milk as essential. We're saying when we have that type of land that becomes part of it as a foundational comment. How do we prepare young men to breastfeed, make it convenient, make it available? Encourage it. That's the question about the future. This book here, um, maybe you all um, have heard about Nancy Brazil. Anybody know about Nancy Brazil? She wrote a book called Clean Sugar. You know the Clean Sugar? Clean Sugar? Oh, all right, I raised my hand, okay. Uh, she wrote that book first um, eight years ago, and uh, Oprah Winfrey. Heard her read, found love with the book, bought the rights of the book, she overbought it in Ava DuVernay, she used the film team. Uh, and you know how she was over, she said the book goes back. So uh, uh, the book company here, um, one of the book companies gave uh, Maddie a advanced contract to do a new book here. And it's mostly about a black farmer in the South. I got invited. Uh, to be doing an essay in this book, and I suggest you all uh, take a look at it. It's the whole idea of, of, of a woman century. You don't see here a few books that are suggesting you all make it part of your library, make it part of your discussion, make it part of the uh, health department library resource, put it online, read it. The title of the book is oh, called We Are. Okay. Up in 
Her book, her poem about Paul Wilson, called Paul Wilson, about her love, Paul Wilson. And what it says is, we are a villain. We are our sisters in the color. For past, present, and future. Symbolizes that. Future says to all, when you get a hold of this, and it's from far back to the same happy I wrote about my family, and so forth. So it's about one girl. My heart at the time, she was a woman from Kenya. She's a beautiful sister who was brilliant. She went off, got educated, and a number of colleges, and so many degrees. And then when she came back to her home country in order to, and I think she was going to take some higher position, she came and spoke for women, the local women in my rural area. And their concerns were not about things that she thought of or she prepared for. They were about the lack of firewood in their community to be able to cook and to be able to do the things they needed to do in their home. And so instead of uh, going and working in the government, which she thought she was going to do, she worked and organized with the women. And to that end, what they did is they went, there was a whole bunch of deforestation happening in Kenya at that time. And the, the government was opposed started those seedlings, created businesses for themselves, and used that in order to plant over 30 million trees. Wow. One woman with her idea of going out into the community, because it wasn't just her, it was her working in partnership with those women's groups. And, and what she did, yeah. Sister uh, Wangari, Brought in a parliamentary form of government, set a structure of broad parliament, and so on. Win one Nobel Peace Prize. I'm sorry. <laughs> one Nobel Peace Prize. One Nobel Peace Prize. Okay. Thank you. So, now, you can see that there's a trap door here. Now, this book here, talking about black, this thing ought to be the, to be the Bible of the spiritual text of this country. It's about turning to the land. These real cheap scriptures, I'm, I'm sorry, written by Leo Penniman. Everyone has a copy of it. Leo Horn, one of the New York called Profile Farm. He died by the spirit, part of the only one conversation he worked about. So good, so as well. And there are all kinds of rituals and how to do farming and gardening. It's like A to Z. Thank you. 
say the South. We're saying in our country's history, in our country's history, it's been black folk, black farmers who have saved the South of the slum, the misery of the South. That's the role of black farmers. And the role now is the same thing. Globally, It means everyone turns to the land. It doesn't mean you're going to farm. You don't have to find ways to turn to the land. The soil, the dirt, the summer, protect us. It's a sacred meeting. So, we're saying the system here has problems that. Associations, church associations, we're all cooperatives. So the question about the business, we all want to have such a vision of the role of Hopkins. In Ohio, how many co ops are there? Food co ops? Farmers co ops? Part of the vision, part of the work. Consensual to our work. The sister here, I won't forget her, just the memo. And our human stuff are only sub-circles of the earth's work. Again, the idea of earth centric living. I hope I read this book back in 2010 about sustainability. It's still available online. You can get a copy of it. But it's a beautiful book. I have five photographs in here. This is one of my photographs here. And it's called, this is called Gold Dust, which means the black earth is more valuable than gold. That means we all have to honor the folks who, who, are, who are here in Ohio for some 30,000 years. How do we incorporate their wisdom, their knowledge, their culture into whatever we do? The business wisdom, turtle islands, the whole cosmology about North America, turtle islands, how we support these dudes, these, these uh, small barrel construction with kids. I suggest you all might think about working with kids and incorporating small barrel construction with, uh, with them, symbolizing the turtle islands. Back to where they have been living and, 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 and growing for thousands of years. Like in Ohio, what, what plants were traditionally grown in Ohio? Many people who were chilleteers, who were Native American out west, more California than people back here. So, what role can the health department, Ohio State, building farm operations, and getting those seeds back here in Ohio? It's a great. Yeah, you don't hear, but since you look at the dresses, of the matriation. And in, in Montana, they have a state law that requires K through 12, all the students there must learn about Native American history. Okay. So what you all do in your organization, this is something similar. We think it's part of the pathway, it's important. You say Carver is an important pathway, not just him, but many people around him. He represents what I call the African American ethos. So he's, a, he's an important pathway to the future. You see how Ohio State and NASA uh, people are, are utilizing him uh, as part of their work of, of setting out there for one tomorrow. Right. So we say, don't question his legacy, his relevance. Be about the business of remembering him, honoring him. Again, the path into the future. On this path that you're here, where are you at in this path? Where, where, where are you at? Where am I at? Is the idea that slide done by Bill Cunningham. There's a great book called The Green Vision of Harvard Ford. Let's check that out. He's friends with all the presidents. He's friends with, um, you know, Gandhi. Wonder why our king adopted the amount of promises from, um, from Gandhi because of tolerance. That's why he adopted that philosophy. This is a picture of my uh, great grandfather. Boys, I didn't eat well as a kid. 
Kentucky on three occasions. Oh, it's Chautauqua. He's also a friend with Edison and Einstein. These guys went to Chattery right beside me. They, they said Carver was the greatest country up there, up to the Carroll, of Judge Hill. That's what they said about him. He wasn't the greatest black man in America. He said the greatest country of this era is how they viewed him. Again, you mentioned he's, um, he's, he's uh, being lifted up. Station. The, the new, one up there now has a drug public science lab. The one that's going to be going to Mars in about 2040. We also have some of the public work up there as well. What I do here, real quickly, I get asked all the time what are the very best work on Harvard? On the left, the white is in a PDF, about 180 pages, written by the uh, And uh, we're talking about youth art and hip hop. We were saying we already was incorporating Bruce Lee, I don't believe in demons in the hive, and that kind of thing. Talk about Bruce Lee, Beyonce, talk about Negro, talk about Snoop, okay? I'm saying, where is hip hop within all of these work that your government, your organization, your farm, your, your uh, university? I asked the same question over March for what it means as of February. Where are the hip hop artists? and the future and, and health disparity. Come on, y'all. What the future? Uh, uh, maybe we uh, have a boost. saying the seed work is part of justice work. Right now in America, most of these companies are 80% companies are they're not very smart, not very resilient. We ought to be growing seed and becoming seed savers as part of the pathway forward. Now, in conclusion, we're going to talk about We're going to address that in this afternoon. Harper said, when there is no vision, there is no hope. We should all have our own personal vision, organizational vision, faith vision within your church or faith institution, within your city. Not just a vision statement. Now, I'm going to end up with this quote right here. I'm going to switch to Bailey. Read that and talk a little bit about it.
Thank you, Jim and Jennifer. Can we have one more round of This next number is Thank you. 